Good Good morning. Wow. It is a beautiful day to celebrate black history, black people, and the Negro League. I am excited and I can't even, I'm, I'm nervous right now because look, I'm standing up here among legends. I don't even know how I got here. But I will say this, Fernando Hamilton, Thomas Shield Randolph, Bessie Hamilton, Louise Randolph, Alex Upshaw Randolph, Josie Randolph, my legacy, that they could be here today. They were a part of all the things that we're gonna talk about. And they understand what the Negro League went through and to see it today and what has happened and what we're celebrating would be a joy. It is an honor to stand here and introduce you to some of our history being made today. I am among legends of, in their own right. And I wanna introduce you to, just. I'm just gonna go through some quick bios. Most of these guys, well all of these guys up here, none of them need introductions because everybody know them. But I get to t say it anyway, right? <laughs> Y'all know I like to talk, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna start with, our county executor, we have Frank White. Frank White is a legend in his own right. Frank White Jr. has uh, proudly served as Jackson County uh, Executive since 2016 and was reelected in November of 2022 for another four year term. He is the first African American to hold the position and is committed to building a better and more equitable community. His vision to achieve that goal is rooted in the county's signature program, Our Healthy Kansas City Eastside, which addresses health care inequalities on the city's east side by increasing access to COVID-19 vaccinations and preventive health services. Additional accomplishments include providing fair living wages to the county staff, comprehensive fertility services, and expanding paid parental leave. A proud product of Kansas City's East Side, County Executive White played 18 years with the Kansas City Royals and is enshrined in the Royals Hall of Fame at Kauffman Stadium. That's what I was waiting on. That's what I was waiting on. You need to understand he is also the first base coach at the Monarchs now. <laughs> he is still, he, uh, this man, I don't know, I don't even think he stops working. Uh, we are happy to have him here. That gives, gives him the dis distinction of being the only major league to play in a stadium that he literally helped build and he is going to see through another whole building. <laughs> now he serves as the chief executive of the county that uh, owns the stadium. Come on now. <laughs> Tell me that's not history. Next on the panel, we have Kansas City, Missouri's mayor, Mayor Quentin Lucas. Quentin was sworn in on August 1st, 2019 as the 55th mayor of Kansas City. He's the youngest elected Kansas City mayor in more than a generation, known affectionately as Mayor Q. To many, to many citizens, he prioritizes making Kansas City neighborhoods safer, creating more accessible and affordable housing and public transportation, maintaining efficiency and transparency in government and governance, and improving basic services. And we all know that Quentin is everywhere. <laughs> Born and raised in Kansas City, Mayor Q has spent most of his life in the city's urban core. As a child, his family moved often and even experienced homelessness. Despite these challenges, Quentin remained focused on his schoolwork, 
earning academic scholarships in, uh, to high school, college, and eventually Cornell school, Law School before returning home to Kansas City. In 2015, Mayor Q won a city council seat representing Kansas City's third district at large, where he focused on bridging the gap between East and West in an economically and racially divided city. Mayor Lucas remains focused on building a safer Kansas City, leading, the, the divisiveness, the, leading with divisiveness, decisiveness, I'm sorry, I can't even speak this morning, decisiveness, he's not a divider, uh, during, the, the 29th, uh, the, the, during the COVID-19 pandemic to save lives, as well as addressing generations long pandemic of violence, violent crime in Kansas City. Mayor Q, is a mayor that you see everywhere. Mayor Q is working very hard to maintain what is going on in Kansas City and to bring us together and unify us. Mayor Quentin Lucas. <laughs> Certainly another mayor who has made history is Mayor Tyrone Garner. Mayor Tyrone Garner is the 31st mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, and the fifth mayor CEO since city council, uh, the city council, city count, count, county, there's a Y missing, <laughs> city county consolidation in 1997. So that's the unified government. Mayor Garner was sworn into office on December 13, 2021. The mayor's office is responsible for overseeing the official activities of the unified government, working in conjunction with the board of commissioners and the county administrator. Mayor Garner is dedicated to providing bold, visionary, decisive, and encourage and community-driven leadership to meet and exceed a reasonable expectation that the community has for its elected officials. He over, his overriding goal is to work alongside community members to make all of Wyandotte County a great and safe place to live, work, and raise a family. And I am partial because I am on his team. <laughs> so I want you all to meet these gentlemen right here. Uh, but before we go any further, this man definitely does not need an introduction. I thought they would have clapped when I said I was on his team. You know it's still early, Quentin, so we're still a little sleep. Get your coffee. Finally, this, and I'm not going to say finally. I'm going to say this man needs no introduction. Bob Kendrick, a friend to everyone, a leader, and was the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in March of 2011. Founded in 1990, the Negro, Baseball, the Negro League Baseball Museum is the world's only museum dedicated to preserving and celebrating the rich history of African American baseball and its profound impact on the social advancement of America. Kendrick's appointment as president marked a celebration a celebrated return to the Negro League Baseball Museum after a 13-month departure. He became the museum's first director of marketing in 1998 and was named vice president of marketing in 2009 before accepting the post as executive director of the National Sports Center for the Dis Disabled Kansas City in 2010. Kendricks is responsible for the museum's day-to-day -day operations and the development and implementation of strategies to advance the mission of the 501c3 non-for-profit organization. Since rejoining the Negro League Baseball Museum in 2011, he has helped orchestrate a nearly $20 million turnaround that has helped the Negro Baseball Museum regain its vitality and financial stability. Bob Kendrick is not only a pioneer, but he is the greatest storyteller in the whole wide world. In the whole wide world. I want to, before I ask you to direct your attention to the screen, I want to first also thank 
uh, the whole team at the Negro League Baseball Museum for the hard work that they do. You don't know the work that they put in behind the scenes. I want to thank Kiana Sinks for the work that she does. I just I want to thank uh, Joan, and I also want to thank uh, Miss Kathy. Never failing, always doing so. All the excellence that you see, even though Bob is the face, he has a team that does great work. So right now, I want you all to turn and direct your, your attention to the screen for a short video. I'm standing in front of the Paseo YMCA. The building was completed in 1914 and was the result of a challenge grant issued by white philanthropist Julius Rosenwald. And if that name sounds familiar to you, Rosenwald led the Sears and Roebuck Company for years, where Rosenwald had been issuing these challenge grants to help build both African-American schools and YMCA's throughout the country. Well, here in Kansas City, both the African-American and white community came together and not only raised the funds necessary to meet the grant requirements, but exceeded the grant requirements. In 1914, this building opened here in the heart of the African-American community as a place for refuge, as a social gathering place, and was really the primary meeting place in the African-American community outside the church, where perhaps its most famous meeting took place on February 13, 1920, when Andrew Roop Foster led a contingent of eight independent black baseball team owners into Kansas City. They met here at the Purcell YMCA, and out of that meeting, the birth of the Negro National League the first successful organized black baseball league. The Negro Leagues then would go on to operate amazingly for 40 years, from 1920 until 1960. Fast forward to the mid 2000s, another white philanthropist, the late great Landon Rowland, purchased this building which sadly had been left abandoned, was harboring illicit activity, had been boarded up and had become an eyesore. Well, he purchased the building for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in hopes that we could then redevelop it as an amazing expansion of the museum to convert it into the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. Well, under the tireless leadership of the barbecue baron, Ollie Gates, who took leadership of this project, we've completely transformed this building. And now it is majestic once again. The exteriors have been redone. The interior has been gutted and we're starting that process to redevelop this building into the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center, an amazing expansion of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. When completed, the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center will house classroom space, office space, expanded exhibit opportunities, an amazing ballroom space for social events. In essence, we've converted it back to what it used to be when it was the hub of activity here in the African American community. We're so excited about this expansion and essentially going full circle right back to the building that gave birth to the story that we're now charged with preserving. Good morning, good morning everyone. And welcome to the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center I was watching that video, and I was so thankful I didn't wear that suit today. <laughs> like, wow, I'm glad I didn't wear that. Now, you know, we shot that a little over a year or so ago, and uh, this project has meant so much to this community. Uh, and I would be remiss. It's a little early for the barbecue baron to be up, you know, because he stays up late night. But I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the leadership of Ollie Gate who was a dear friend of Buck O'Neill's, who was absolutely determined to see this building transformed into the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. This was a longtime dream of Buck's. When he didn't get in the Hall of Fame in 2006, everybody was obviously very angry, upset about that. Buck wanted everyone to focus on this project. He wanted, this meant more to him than getting in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. You have to understand that education was at the forefront of this man's existence. A man who was denied an opportunity to be educated at his native Sarasota High School as a kid. And he talked about how he cried when his grandmother told him they were building a new high school there in Sarasota. 
Sarasota High. And Buck said, he's running around. I'm going to Sarasota High. I'm going to Sarasota High. And his grandmother pulled him down and said, son, you, you won't be able to go to Sarasota High School. And he says, why, Grandma? Because Sarasota High School is for white kids only. And Buck said he cried. And his grandma said, son, don't cry. One day, all kids will be able to go to Sarasota High School. And when you know, it was years later that Sarasota High School gave Buck O'Neill an honorary diploma. And he came back to his native Sarasota High School. They moved the graduation from the gymnasium to the football field because it was that many people wanting to see his high school graduation. And as he gave his speech, he looked amongst the crowd and he saw this tremendous, beautiful gathering of people of all shade together, just like his grandma had said. And, and so this was so meaningful to Buck. And so as we are getting ever so close to making his dream a reality. We wanted to have this event in this space, and soon it will be available for you to rent. I, I want to make sure we get that out there, too. As soon as we, <laughs> we finish with a temporary accessibility issue so that we can make sure all citizens can gain access to this space. We're grandfathered in. We don't have to do it, but we should do it, and we will do it. So we won't make this available until all of our citizens can have access to this space. I would also be remiss if I did not recognize my friend and former city councilman, Jermaine Reed, who helped steer quite a bit of funding for this project so as we've been able to advance it. And so I can't thank you all enough for getting up on President's Day. Yeah, this was originally scheduled for February the 13th. Uh, and when that, that, when that team called the Kansas City Chiefs advanced to the Super Bowl, we figured we might want to move this event because we didn't want to take all the people away from the Chiefs celebration. <laughs> so we did so, but seven days later, we gather here on what would be the recognition of the 103rd anniversary of the birth of the Negro Leagues, established by the legendary Andrew Rube Foster, who was an absolute genius. Rube Foster, in my own estimation, is the greatest baseball mind this sport has ever seen. And I think what he did to establish the Negro Leagues is one of the most significant occurrence, not in baseball history, but in American history. So we proudly celebrate Rube Foster and his ingenuity with a conversation built around leadership with these legendary African-American leaders of our city. If there was one disappointment as I sat here and I was listening to Kim and I look at this image, we're going to have to do this again because we're going to have to do this in front of as many children as we possibly can. This is the picture that I want them to see because it is a true indication of just how progressive the Metroplex really is. And, and so I thank each and every one of you for giving up your time out of your schedule. I know everybody is extraordinarily busy. I also want to make sure that I recognize members of our board of directors who are with us here today. So members of our board of directors, would you please stand and be acknowledged and thank you all for your leadership. And Kim mentioned our incredible staff, and I get a lot of fanfare. But that fanfare is only made possible because I get to work with a tremendous team who believe in everything that we're doing in and around this museum, and they give it all they got every single day. I know I drive them crazy, and they just keep doing it, and they do it with a smile because I think we all realize that the work that we're doing is bigger than who we are, and that if we do it right, we will leave something that will stand the test of time, that others will get to enjoy. And any time that you're able to leave a legacy, I think that is one of the most gratifying and rewarding things that we can ever do. And so one day I hope my granddaughter will bring her children to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and say, you know what? Your great grandfather had something to do with that. And that's what motivates you. 
and, and it keeps us moving. And, and I was just telling one of the reporters, we've had a great year just in the month of February. I'm not sure what we're going to do for an encore because if you didn't know, our friends over at the Kansas City Royals have made the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum absolutely free of charge the entire month of February. This is the second year that we've done this in partnership with Royals, the Royals and Royals Charities, and I cannot thank them enough for their generosity. I am seeing huge crowds of families coming to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, and that's really what it's all about. I love it when the school age groups come on their own, but I love it even more when the families are coming and they are sharing this history and passing it down from generation to generation. So please give an applause to our friends over at Royals Charities and the Kansas City Royals. Sharita, thank you so very much. We released our first ever animated series on the Negro Leagues. It is called Undeniable, and it is done in partnership with Major League Baseball. And this series, a series of three animated shorts, is absolutely amazing. Because again, I hope it indicates the forward thinking of this museum. We have to find ways to make this history relevant to an ever-changing generation of young people. As I remind folks, Negro Leagues baseball hadn't been played in over six decades. But the relevancy and the life lessons that stem from this story are as important today or more important than ever before. And we have to find ways to engage with a new generation. And, and so that project is really exciting. And I hope it gets us one step closer to a full-length animated feature on the Negro Leagues. Yeah, can you imagine all the great stories, Q, that Buck O'Neill shared that would be brought to life through animation? That's not video on the Negro Leagues. So now all of these stories are brought to life. And animation lends itself beautifully. And then for those, I don't know if there are any gamers in the room today, but I can tell you now, it was an epic announcement a week ago Monday when we announced that PlayStation, Sony and PlayStation, had included the Negro Leagues in the video game MLB The Show 23. Wow. Uh, yes. Now, I know some of you about my age and probably the last gaming system that you had, if it was like me, was probably an Atari. <laughs> but this is groundbreaking, and this is going to introduce the Negro Leagues to a generation of young folks who are absolutely going to fall in love with the likes of Satchel Paige, Buck O'Neill, Martin DeHigo, all these great stars who are being included in this game. It is a four-year commitment from Sony and PlayStation. It's going to generate a little money to help this museum, but man, the fact that so many people are gonna make this connection is really, really exciting to us. We've got a full slate of events and activities planned over the course of this year, but what we've seen in the month of February alone has been monumental. I feel like I could just kinda of hang it up and go play golf the rest of the year, but I can't. <laughs> I want to, but I can't. But, <laughs> but anyway. That's enough from me. I want you to hear from some of these amazing folks. And, and so I'm going to start down on, on the far right with Mayor Q. You grew up in this neighborhood. You've now seen the transformation of this building. And what comes to mind now as you walk into this incredible edifice uh, that is going to be called the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center? Well, first of all, good morning. Happy President's Day to you. I want to note the honor I have in being on this platform with these impressive people. Mr. Frank White, who could have just this presentation to himself and the stories that he can tell about meeting Negro Leagues baseball players, his own baseball career, his own life, picking cotton, doing all the work that you've done, helping build the stadium. It's an honor to be with you. And Tyrone Garner, who I've met more recently, but knowing about his decades of public service to his community, his love of Wyandotte County. And I've learned more about Wyandotte. Y'all possessive about, <laughs> you know, yeah, y'all just about the only ones in the region who like, yeah, I'm, I'm really from KCK, right, y'all? <laughs> but it has been an honor getting to know him as well. And so thank you all for being here. This neighborhood is home and is special. And I'll think about just a few stories I'll tell and, and keep us moving. First, uh, I lived across the street for about 13 years. 
And I got to meet Mr. Kendrick during that time and others and Councilman Reed before I was in public service. And people were always saying, no, we, we gonna get this project done. And thanks to Jermaine, thanks to Mr. Gates, thanks to so many who were saying, we are going to make sure that we tell the true story of what happened in this venue and what it launched for our country, our society years later is something that's been special to me. As for the, telling the stories of the Negro Leagues themselves, a lot of us have at the time we got to know them. And for me, I was blessed to have it in my childhood because my mother is a wonderful woman. She didn't want to get up today, unlike, unlike some. <laughs> so I'm going to tell her that everybody is calling on her uh, to be here. But I remember back in probably the early 1990s, late 1980s, my mother started finding Negro Leagues baseball shirts and would outfit me for school almost as an act of, of defiance. If I was going to a majority white school, she would have me in a Negro Leagues baseball shirt every day. <laughs> every morning. <laughs> Birmingham, Black Bears, whatever else. I'll just be walking up into that school, having them teachers be like, man, his mama's really trying to tell us something. <laughs> and she was, right? That we will cherish our history, that we will value it, and no matter where we travel, the Negro Leagues, our story is part of us. And what has been great about this museum, and Bob can tell you this, and he knows the stories of everyone, for those past 60 years since the end of the Negro Leagues, those stories have been spreading and shared in places large and small. We have been sharing those stories, but it is so special to have a place where you can make a pilgrimage here, get a chance to learn the story. I love going to other cities and parts of our country where people say, yeah, I've been to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I got to walk those bases. I got to hear those stories. I got to experience it. It is something that is more special than perhaps those of us in Kansas City even know. So having the chance to expand that story in this beautiful building, and I love that we have this beautiful, preserved building right here that allows somebody just for an, a minute to walk in and kind of know what folks were thinking ba about way back when. That's what's special to me, and that's why I thank everyone who has been a part of helping this beautiful restoration. And perhaps a little bit like Mr. Kendrick, I know there is always more money that you can give. So uh, make sure that you continue to support, to share the mission, no, 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 and to share the message. Thank you, Q. Thank you, <laughs> Mayor Q. You. Yeah, no, anytime they say it ain't about the money, it's always about the money. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all thought you were getting a free breakfast. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Mayor Garner, we've carried the Negro Leagues across state lines over to your great city with a, an exciting partnership with the new branded Kansas City Monarchs, as we say, a reign reborn. What did that partnership mean to you uh, as we were formulating it and you've been working side by side with Mark Brandmeier, who is the owner of the Kansas City Monarch baseball franchise? Well, uh, Thank you, and uh, I appreciate everyone here in Kansas City, Missouri for welcoming Wyandotte County. If, if my team would just raise their hand, if you, some folks on my team, yeah, yeah. We also have Commissioner Bynum. He, she's from the Unified Government as well, and she's also uh, the chair of the KCATA board. So these are some faces that we hope you, when you see them, say hello to them, because Wyandotte County, yes, we are part of the greater metropolitan Kansas City area, and it means a lot to us to have the monarchs there. Um, just really uh, honing in that history. Um, when you talk about the monarchs and, and, and what that means to, to black history, when you talk about February and it's Black History Month, um, Mr. Hendricks, everything you're doing. Uh, when you talk about Mr. White, uh, everything he's done. Um, when you talk uh, with the royals and, and that history that's involved in him as well. Um, and then African Americans throughout. Who would have thought? And I tell people all the time, um, in 2023, we have come a long way where you've actually got a Quentin and a Tyrone as mayors, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's real. <laughs> but that's powerful. Not that we don't have more work to do, but that is a reality that we are progressing. And so when you talk about the Monarchs and what that means to Wyandotte County, and Kansas, it means a lot um, because it allows us to share in that legacy uh, of African-American pride and what it meant to the sport. Um, and even to have Mr. White over there as being a part of that. And so uh, 
having that that shared interest uh, on both sides of of the uh, the line when you talk about Kansas and Missouri and bringing um, that love and that, and that spirit of, of athletic camaraderie together. And the folks in Wyandotte County, we love it. Uh, not just in Wyandotte County, but we've got a lot of folks from all over uh, the metro um, and Kansas that come and enjoy that venue um, that's out at, uh, at our stadium. And so um, it, we're proud of it. Um, we, we champion it. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure it's sustainable in the years ahead. And we encourage everyone, if you haven't been to a Monarchs game, please come and, yes. and see Frank White. Yes. <laughs> As yeah. well as the other players, uh, they they really are a championship uh, a team um, to be reckoned with. So yeah, no, th thank you, thank you, Mayor Garner, and, and I echo his sentiment. Go over and support this team because when you do so, you're supporting the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum as well. This was not a charitable kind of partnership. This is a business partnership that was fostered by the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum with Mark Brandmeier and his team. And so for every person who walks in and buys a ticket for a Monarchs game, for uh, all the food and beverages sold at the stadium, all merchandise sold, it helps support the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and it's good baseball. So I encourage all of you, make plans to get over there and see those Kansas City Monarchs play. Because again, every time those young people are putting on those Monarch pinstripes, they are channeling the spirit of Buck O'Neill and Satchel Paige, Willard Brown, Hilton Smith, all of those legendary stars who were so proud to put on that Monarch uniform. So please get over to Legends Field and make sure you check out those Kansas City Monarchs. Now, Mr. Frank White, you might be the only one of this group that actually played basketball in this very space that we're sitting. This used to be the gymnasium. Yeah, this was a gymnasium, and if any of you are familiar with old YMCAs, that they would have the gymnasium, and they would have a running track that ran around the gymnasium, and Vic, you couldn't shoot a jumper no, from, the from the corner. You couldn't shoot. <laughs> you couldn't shoot a jumper from the corner. You pretty much had to shoot them all straight out, straight on. Uh, and so, you, what does it mean for you to be back in this space and to see the transformation that has occurred? Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, I want to thank my illustrious panel panelists for their comments and uh, really enjoy the, the, the opportunity to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, in your uh, video presentation, there was a photo that popped up a couple times of a group of black kids out front of this building, and I probably could have been one of those kids because we played a lot of basketball in here. We spent a lot of time in this building, and then it's like anything else. You go away for a while, and the building is not there, but when I came back, uh, for the uh, initial opening of this building and seeing all the great work they've done in here, uh, it was, I was really impressed because the building was going to be more than just a gymnasium, more than just a warning track. It was going to be more of an educational center for our students and our kids to come and, and learn uh, uh, how, to, how to do computers and things like that. So more of an educational center for everybody. So I, I really am thrilled to see the, the whole area come back because uh, I spent a lot of time uh, on Vine Street. Uh, growing up, I went to Lincoln High School, and which is right up the street, and I can name every business that was on uh, 18th and Vine, and and just being able to see things slowly coming back is is encouraging. And the people that are putting their hands on it, trying to make sure that we do the right things to bring it back to the way it was, uh, I'm really excited about that. And I think that the uh, the ability to have a uh, Mayor Lucas, uh, Mayor Garner, myself. Uh, just having these, these type of leaders in our community, I think it's really up to us to uh, uh, get together and figure out how to get things moving because if we don't do it now, it's probably not going to get done. So this is our opportunity to do it, and we just need to continue to work together yeah. on projects and things like that. But, Bob, this is a, a tremendous honor for me to be here today to be able to uh, see where this building has come from. I remember back in 1990 when we had our first meeting on the museum and, and the six – uh, great uh, Negro League players that were there that day. Yes. And you go from there to where we are uh, across the street to here. It's all coming together. And you remember in the Lincoln Building, you know, we had to take turns paying the rent every month because no one had any money. So, <laughs> so, so, so it was more of an idea. And so this is, this is better than an idea. This is more visual, and I think people are more visual. And to see where we are in this uh, building today and to envision what's going to happen 
uh, in the future is, is pretty impressive. It, it, it really has. And, and again, I think it has been a testament not only to the institution, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, but the people who have been involved with this museum now in its 33rd year when no one gave it any chance of succeeding when it started in that little one-room office and they were literally passing the hat around to pay the monthly rent to keep that little office open. But what you did have was a dedicated group of people who believed. And that it is amazing what belief can do. And even again, when we talk to our young people and they come through the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, it is about instilling belief, belief in self that you can accomplish whatever you set your heart and mind to accomplishing. And so, yeah, we did this in a very much non-traditional fashion. We're still doing it in very much a non-traditional fashion, but it has made the journey, I think, even more rewarding. Yeah, we would love to have a bunch of money to start this project when we did in 1990. We didn't, but we're working on it. And we've got friends of ours. We've got folks here from the Hall Family Foundation. We've got my friend Gloria Jackson Leathers over here from Kaufman Foundation. They've been tremendously supportive, as so many of you who are in this room. And we just have to continue to maintain that, that kind of enthusiasm around what I think, and I'm biased, the best baseball history museum anywhere in the world, and it's right here at Historic 18th and Vine. And we're still dreaming. But now we're dreaming out loud. And that's a, uh, that's a beautiful stage to be at. I want to talk to each of you about risk taking. <laughs> you see, Rube Foster had to convince seven other independent black baseball team owners to give up their independency, to come together as an organized body in order for black baseball to thrive. He had to be a master salesman in order to do that. And somehow when they met in this building on February 13, 1920, he did just that. They all signed on. And the event today is called We Are the Ship. And when Ruth Foster convinced these owners to come on board, they signed the charter, he stood here in this very building and he proclaimed, we are the ship, all else the sea. And y'all, he, he was sending a warning to Major League Baseball that a new player had arrived on the scene to be reckoned with. I guess you could say that it was indeed their declaration of independence. So, Mayor Q, you have to make some difficult decisions. And I know part of your job is about building, all of your jobs, is about building consensus. But I would Curious just to know what your thought process is about risk taking. Because for me, if you are afraid to take risk, you stay mired exactly where you are. Yeah. So for me, I, I am willing to step out there and take the risk. And if I fail, I'll say, hey, it was my bad. Yeah, I'm sure many of my board members are looking at me kind of crazy when I said I was going to try to do a hot dog festival. Uh -huh, and, and Congressman Cleaver still said, man, I thought you had lost your mind. <laughs> a hot dog festival? But you know, for us, risk taking has always been something that we look at and that we're willing to do. What is your thoughts about risk taking? I want to pose that question to each of you. Risk taking is the most important thing that I think you need to do in, in really any place, not just in public leadership, in business, even in your personal life, right? Each of us made a decision to run for the offices that we are in now. And there were a number of people who told us for whatever reasons, nah, don't do it. The, you know, this organization's too corrupt or, or there's something else going on or in my situation, you're too young or anything of that sort. So I think that's, a, that's an important one, but I think taking risk, the most important thing you, you need to always measure is the good of the organization and the people that you are there for. You need to say, will we be in a better place later if I take this important step somewhere? And, and then you just, and then the next thing is, you gotta believe in yourself after. <laughs> Don't jump out there and then be like, oh, I didn't mean to be in the deep end of the pool, <laughs> right? Because then you start splashing and you drown, right? You need to say, you know what? I know I can make it across. And I'll give just one very brief example, in an example that you may not 
think of much. During our 2020 summer, and I know Frank was in office then, and many of you remember, a whole bunch of stuff going on, a <laughs> whole bunch of stuff. COVID-19, I was the subject of, I think, five recall efforts during that time. Uh, there were a whole bunch of things happening. And I remember after a particularly, particularly with the protests themselves, after a, a night on the Country Club Plaza where I don't think anybody thought things went the way that our city should have them. The deployment of tear gas, all these sorts of things that just, frankly, hurt my heart to see. I remember having a conversation with our then police chief and others and talking about not having the same police presence the next day. Not having our officers in the same gear, not having that sort of look of an armada and that conflict that was happening. And I remember one of the voices that I had that discussion with coming at me and said, well, what if the plaza gets burnt down? Oh, my God, right? And just thinking, it won't. <laughs> it won't. People want to be heard. People want to be respected and understood and listened to fundamentally. And maybe instead of seeing everything as a conflict, maybe there's a way that we can show that we're listening. And so we did. And at least for the rest of that moment, you didn't see that same level of conflict. Instead, you saw, I think, a shift in people actually making sure they listen. That was a small risk, not fundamental necessarily to long-term survival of the organization, but one that I think we needed to take. So one thing, Bob, and I'll wrap with this, is they really come up to you every day. Not every time you step out is it an existential crisis for your organization necessarily. Kansas City was going to be around in a month. But what type of Kansas City did we want? Yeah. And I think that's one area that I, I take some pride in. Yeah. Mayor Garner, I, I'll pose that same question. How do you view risk taking? Well, uh, I think it starts with a vision. Um, you, gotta, you just can't look at who you are, but who do you want to be? Where do you want to be? Um, this being African American Month, it takes me back to all the risk takers uh, that come from the African American community. Uh, one of the big things we champion in Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas, is the Quindara Ruins. And we look back of those folks that came from uh, slavery, seeking freedom, and what that could be and what that could look like, and took all the risks that came with that uh, to, to cross over from Missouri into free Kansas um, through the Quindara Ruins. We look at Rosa Parks and what she did, saying enough is enough, and said, I'm going to take my rightful place on that bus, and I'm going to take that risk. I may get beat, I may get arrested, but I'm going to take that risk and I'm going to do that because it's the right thing to do. Um, not just for me, but for so many others um, that didn't want to take that risk. Um, you look at so many other leaders, Martin Luther King marching and, and being jailed. Uh, we can go and look at Mandela spending all those years in jail and for fighting for freedom and, and those types of things. And then you can come to today and look at a, a lot of our leaders. Uh, uh, mayor Lucas, being a young mayor uh, in the big scheme of things, and, and Frank Wright, and, and so many other leaders that we can really pinpoint and said, I'm not too young. I haven't done enough. Uh, I can be the first black. Um, and really taking these risks when, when the haters and naysayers say that you can't, we prove to them um, that, that we can. And then that starts with that vision of what success and opportunity can look like. And you hit on that, Mr. Kendricks. These young people need to see those risk takers because now that opportunity and that door of what can be becomes real for them. And so when you talk about the reality of risk taking, you have to make risk because it takes you beyond mediocrity and takes you to that point of possibility. Yeah. So. Yeah. Frank, same question, man. Well, Bob, I uh, the mayors here have, have hit on so many <laughs> very quality points. On, on risk taking, but I, I got to go back to when I was a kid and 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 growing up in my community and and then getting to the point where I felt I wanted to be a baseball player. And the risk I had to take was going to my boss and asking for two days off, <laughs> it, you know, to, to try out for the uh, the Rawls Baseball Academy. And and I thought that was a huge risk. Uh, but after getting through my career and deciding I wanted to go into politics and I wanted to help my community in a different way, and everybody's saying, you know, why do you want to ruin your your legacy like that, your legacy in baseball. I said, well, I'm about people. And, and if I can use this, you know, I, I think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said, uh, Abdul said it best. He said, you know, it's not about the trophies or the championships. It's about using those as currency 
to help people. And I think that is basically how I looked at it. And I had to get used to going through a career where people say all good things about you to hearing a lot of bad things that people think about you. But at the same time, you have to, you have to move forward because it's all about helping people. It's all about using your life's experiences to make the community better. And as Mayor Q hit on earlier, I, I'm from a segregated South in Mississippi, and, 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 and Jackie Robinson was a segregated South in Georgia. But being able to fight through these things and be successful, I mean, I think that is where your legacy comes from. And being able to help people along the way. Because I was that kid that had a shovel in the, in the winter, helping neighbors, and a rake in the fall, and a, and a, and a lawnmower in the summer. So I think these, this has always been in my DNA to, um, to really help people and help people improve their quality of life. And, and that's why I do what I do. Uh, and I, there's, it's, not, it's not one of those things you get up in the morning and say, well, what's the day going to bring? You just get up in the morning thinking about how can I make somebody's life better today. And I, and I think these are the things that uh, sports has helped me um, yeah. get, 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 get to this point. Because risk-taking is it's really about doing something outside of your comfort level mm -hmm. and being able to get out there and still – uh, forge ahead and, and be successful at it. Yeah. And when I think about what Jackie Robinson had to do his first year, I mean, all the negative stuff that came at him, mm -hmm. and yet he was able to become Rookie of the Year and, and have a great year and a great career and, and be a Hall of Famer. These are the things that each individual person has inside them that makes them who they are. And when I, th when I think about trying out for the team and struggling through the minor leagues and getting to the major leagues and waiting for a chance to play – then we get that chance to play. You got to take advantage of it. So, so I, I think risk taking is um, as a as an individual. I think it's uh, easier to do. Uh, in the job that I have today, I'd probably be a little more conservative uh, because of all the people it will affect, your decisions will affect. But but bottom line, is, and I think Mary Q hit on it. Bottom line is, if if we're going to be better f by that decision, then you got to be willing to stand up and and and, and take whatever you have to take uh, in order to get to that that end that's going to make people better and i think yeah. that's that is why we do what we do uh it's not it's not all uh all roses but uh at the same time i think that the the decisions that we made generally are the ones that people can abide by and and say that we're really working for their best interests on that on that note frank you walked into a major league baseball career who was the leader of the Royals when you, because, you know, not, not, count, not counting the manager, because usually there's someone in-house that kind of takes on a leadership role. Who was it when you joined the club? Was it any one specific person? Well, they all taught you something. Um, uh, I think uh, Hal McRae was probably the, the one guy that I really trusted the most. Uh, I think in, in order for me to have been successful, and I think that you'll find this in, in everyday life. I think if you've had one person that you really trust that would always tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear, exactly. then I think that's what makes you better. Because I think that it's easy to tell people something that's going to make them feel good, but sometimes you've got to be a little uncomfortable. And if you think you did it one way, I said, no matter what I ask you, just tell me. Uh, tell me the truth all the time. And I, that's what, I think that's what made me um, learn. And those guys back in, the, in those days, coming out of the 60s, they were pretty no-nonsense people. I mean, they were... There was no gray area. Either you did the job or you didn't do the job. And he said, you're making mistakes, you learn from your mistakes, and you get better from your mistakes. Uh, and I think these are the things that, um, that helped me a lot. I mean, Cookie Rojas gave me a, a great piece of advice. He said, when you learn when to do something and when not to do something, you're going to be okay. <laughs> I had no clue what he was talking about. <laughs> but, but when I started playing the game every day, then I realized what he was talking about was your decision making. So when, once you learn when to do it, when not to do it, the game becomes easier and a lot more fun to play. So, but I, I think that uh, leaders come in a lot of different ways. And, and I think the, in, my, in my case, I just needed somebody there to, uh, to really uh, tell me the truth all the time. And, and when Buck was a scout uh, at the Royals, I, in August, two days off, hot every day, I'd go to Buck. I said, Buck, you got your stopwatch today? He said, yeah. I said, put it on me. Because I knew that as long as that stopwatch in my mind was on me, whatever I had that day, they don't get 100%. And so you have all these checks and balances as you go through. And I think these are the things that made me um, uh, the person I was on the field because uh, it was always a challenge. And you had to go out there and meet that challenge every day. And people say, well, what was the most difficult thing about you playing? It wasn't 
95 mile an hour fastballs or playing defense. The hardest thing for me was once you reach that level of your play that people expect from you every day and meeting that challenge every day. Day in, day out. Mm-hmm. That was that was the most difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the end, it was the most fun. Yeah. Yeah, and all the weight of expectation. You know, that, that, that's a heavy weight. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. Mayor Garner, I, I'm curious, who, if anyone, influenced you and your leadership style? Well, I guess I could I could mention a lot of people, so many great leaders uh, that we've known um, just in history. Uh, but... And, and I don't want to sound too simple, but my father, yeah, that no, was no, no. My, my, my greatest example of being a leader, um, him just uh, instilling the morals and the values and the faith that uh, guides me even to this day, uh, my faith, um, how he took care of our family. Um, he worked hard, um, worked a lot of long hours to take care of our family and, and still managed to get up every day um, and go to church spend time when he had time with our family, uh, instill a lot of great values in us, uh, and always talked about doing what's right uh, and doing what's right. Um, because as long as you, I remember him saying, as long as you do right, you can't go wrong. And, in, 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 in instilling those types of values uh, in us, um, uh, and in spite of all the challenges he had, be it financial, be it personal, uh, he persevered. Um, and so that's what really inspired me uh, when you talk about great leaders that that I look to, to yeah. this day, it, it is my father. Mayor Q, same question. Who, if anyone, influenced your leadership style? You know, I've been blessed to to have a number of both leaders and mentors I've seen over the years. I will give a shout out to my mother, but I won't necessarily talk about her on this one. Somebody that I learned about very young was uh, Thurgood Marshall. And whenever I have the time to really kind of get into books about everything that those early NAACP lawyers were facing. These were largely men, but some women, who were arguing in courts that had never had a black person argue in court, in segregated communities, and who were pushing for what seemed to be impossible. And that helps me now whenever I sit back, and and don't get me wrong, and and Frank's got to deal with the same legislature I do. Some days in Missouri seems like a a challenging, troubling place where they are trying to make sure our children can't actually learn culturally responsive teaching, where we are marginalizing some of the very history that you can learn about in this museum. But then I think about, uh, maybe today I ain't feeling like a fight, but I think about every day, these people were there saying, no, I'm ready. I'm going to dedicate my life to that. And there were off ramps. They could have gone into other areas. Thurgood Marshall could have stayed in Baltimore, been a been a lawyer in that town, done something that still probably would have been wonderful, but instead wanted to come to places like this one and so many others. And so for me, it has always been folks like that. But I will say one other. And by the way, never let, and I was just talking to the reporter in the corner about this, never let people minimize the importance of an example. When I was a young man, we got our first wave of black mayors, right? Uh, David Dinkins in New York, Emanuel Cleaver in Kansas City. You had the governor of Virginia, Douglas Wilder. That got me thinking, wow, black folks can do these sorts of things. Meeting the mayor, and I say this with respect to the many, many white mayors this city has had, but meeting the mayor doesn't just mean that you have to leave your community, your culture, yourself. You can do it. It was absolutely exceptional for me to be able to see that. And then one final example of this, and I still remember it to this day, and he wouldn't expect this from me. Some of y'all, many of y'all may know brother Maurice Watson. Mm -hmm. And I remember I saw him walking somewhere. And Maurice, if you don't know him, tall brother, colorful suits, all of that. But I remember I was a young man going in somewhere, and he stopped and held the door for my mother and I. And I was like, wow, who is that? And my mother knew him through a friend, and she's like, he's a lawyer. And I was like, I don't know what a lawyer does, but I need to be like him. The power of examples is just great. And it has shown me a path in so many steps of my life. And I think it's it's why panels like this, and I thank you for it, are key, because our children seeing that can launch amazing opportunities for them. No, that 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 is so true and so very valued. And, And again, it exemplifies why that museum across the street is so vitally important. 
and particularly for our urban kids who walk into an environment and they see people who look just like them, who excelled. They played this game as well as anyone ever played this game, but not only did they play the game, they owned teams. They were managers and they were coaches, they were traveling secretaries, they were team physicians, they fulfilled every role that could be fulfilled within the business of baseball. And so while we are so thrilled to be working arm in arm with that beautiful Kansas City Urban Youth Baseball Academy that is opening its doors and creating opportunities that are helping bridge the financial gap that has certainly priced out a lot of kids from playing our sport, we not only want them to focus on the possibility of a career on the field, we want them to understand every single opportunity that is available for them off the field, still within this great sport. And, and that's so vitally important. We talked about self-belief. And that's what you see. When you believe in yourself, the impossible becomes possible. And, and, and I think that's why that museum is so valuable, even beyond the tremendous work that we do to preserve a piece of history that was literally on the verge of extinction. This story, y'all, was going to die when the last Negro Leaguer left the face of this earth. I tell people all the time, we cannot allow that to happen. The Negro League Baseball Museum doesn't need to survive. It has to survive so that we keep this precious piece of baseball and Americana alive. And, and so it's, a, it's just a tremendous example of, again, what organized leadership can mean. It is transformative, and it gives you hope of what the possibilities are. I want to talk about difficult decisions. I know each of you, every single day, you're making some challenging decisions. And, and, and Frank, I'm going to start with you. What has been one of the most difficult decisions you've had to make in your role as a civic leader? Well, the first difficult decision I had to make was when I got appointed to this position, if, if I wanted to take it or not. <laughs> 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 that, that, that was because I spent my first year on the legislature. But, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I go back to uh, uh, what uh, Mayor Lucas, uh, I think the I think COVID-19 yeah, was, 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 was the most difficult. Yeah. Uh, we had to make decisions on stay home orders, uh, virtual learning, mask mandates. Uh, we were being sued by the attorney general. <laughs> you know, you had a lot of things going on during that time. And, uh, and so I had to, uh, I wanted to be on the right side of this deal. And, and basically it's about public safety and, and how, what, we had, what decisions can we make uh, that's gonna benefit uh, the overall public. And I know Mayor Q and I, we're on the same core four uh, with Johnson County and Wyandotte County, trying to come up with the best solution to uh, keep us um, as, it, as aligned as possible so that we would confuse the public and get the public uh, uh, trust down as to what we're trying to do. But I think, I think really that was the toughest one is going through that and, and really just having that. Uh, I felt good about it because I really felt like uh, it was not a political issue. I thought it was more of a public safety issue. And I was willing to uh, to stand on that. Yeah, Mayor Garner. Well, I'm a fairly new uh, mayor. Uh, just completed my first year. I'd, I'd say in that first year, the hardest decision I had to make was um, just staying true to uh, my commitments. Um, now we've got a, a commission of ten people, um, and no disrespect to any of them and the decisions that they've been making, but uh, I had to veto several um, uh, legislative uh, um, uh, votes um, that they had put in. And that, that was a hard decision because you're going against other governing body members, that colleagues of yours that uh, you know that uh, you have to have good work, working relationships with. Uh, but, and so those were hard decisions uh, for me to make. Um, but um, I had to stay true to my commitments um, to our community uh, in Wyandotte County um, and just do what I felt was right in that regard um, and without um, compromising those relationships. But really hard decisions to make when you talk about uh, Wyandotte County 
um, and just looking at it from my lens of we can't keep doing the same things and expect a different result and really standing firm with that um, in spite of whatever scrutiny may come from it. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Mayor Q, what about you? And I, I know you alluded earlier about the, the, the protest and you too were very much intimately involved in this whole COVID issue. You know, it's been an interesting almost four years because <laughs> if y'all remember, there was this magical time that I call 2019. And I became mayor second half of then. Early 2020, the Chiefs win a Super Bowl. I remember turning to somebody like, this is the easiest, coolest job ever. <laughs> Man, you just get in, everything goes well, and then, you know, things kind of fell off right after that. Um, I will say the, the toughest decisions are knowing how much to fight at certain times. And I'll use COVID as an example. And I'm a, I'm a name names, because, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> Captain Executive White and I would find ourselves sometimes on calls, not just with the group that he had mentioned, but sometimes the entire metro through the Mid-America Regional Council. So, um, and I'd be on with all these mayors of different towns and leaders and different politics. And there's a woman from Gladstone, the mayor of Gladstone, uh, Carol. Uh, she's no longer the mayor. Not that I'm happy about that, but it just <laughs> is what it is. But... Um, no, and Carol would just get all, you know, and they, and Frank knows this, and Tyrone's probably getting this too. They love to fight the mayor, the, the big city, or the county executive. That's, that's their day. So for their town of 20,000 people, they'll be like, COVID is not a problem in Gladstone. Mayor Lucas, you, no one likes you up north, and we will not stand for your tyranny. And, you know, and then she, she tried to pluck a few of my council members. And, you know, they said, we are declaring that Clay County is not a part of Kansas City, Missouri. We will not follow these orders. And I just said, you know, because I'm a calm person, right? I'm a calm person. I just said, well, here's what we're going to do. And I said to my council colleagues, if you try to proceed on this, I will make sure that the $40 million project that y'all want done absolutely never happens. Right, mayor's got a few powers. And what I'm gonna do is make sure that not only am I protecting the people, yes, in the third district, which you think is a magical different place of black folks, but also your friends and neighbors in Kansas City North. And what's gonna end up happening even more than that is that Gladstone and Liberty and all of them are gonna follow our orders because we're that big. And it ended up happening. And so for me, the thing was to say, kind of like Frank was saying, you stick to your, you stick to the reason you're doing it, None of us wanted to see anybody shut down or anything shut down. I like, I don't know, going to the store, all of that. But we weren't gonna abandon people. And what hurt us, and we both talked about this a lot during the time, when we were seeing the data on blacks, Latinos, new American populations that were disproportionately impacted, what I was not gonna do was say, well, I really wanna be popular on North Vivian Road. Instead, what we were gonna do was actually fight to make sure we we're looking out for everybody. And let me give a shout out to Frank. Because Jackson County ain't just where we are right now. There's a whole lot of Jackson County. I love it all. He loves it all much more. And he was willing to go to every edge of that county when folks were trying to step up and say, you can't do this. And he said, you know what? I'm going to take that risk, knowing he had a reelection coming up. And that, to me, was what strong decision-making is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's funny that you mentioned 2019, Super Bowl. You get elected 19, Super Bowl. Well, we're standing in this building February 13th of 2020, and it didn't look like this. It was just framed up at that point in time, and we're standing here. Frank is here, Mayor Q, Rob Manfred, the Commissioner of Major League Baseball, Xavier James, Chief Operating Officer of Major League Baseball's Players Association, John Sherman, who had just bought – the Kansas City Royals, so our new owner was there, Kiki Curls, uh, State Senator of Missouri, Mike Kehoe, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Missouri. We all had gathered here for the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Negro Leagues. And, and Major League Baseball and the Players Association announced a joint $1 million contribution to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And anyone who knows me knows that any time a check is involved, <laughs> I'm happy. And needless to say, I was all smiles. But I was even more excited about the announcement of the first ever National Day of Recognition that Major League Baseball was going to do. They were going to, for the very first time, 
all 30 major league clubs were going to salute the Negro Leagues, wear our anniversary logo, stage a tip your cap to the Negro Leagues in stadium. So we lay out our plans for a year-long 100th anniversary celebration, and, and I'll let y'all in on a secret. Anyone who understands nonprofits organizations, you will learn that we will make up an anniversary. <laughs> we, <laughs> will we not, will we not, Reverend Hill? We will create an anniversary if we think we can raise some money around it. But the 100th anniversary was legitimate. This was a legitimate anniversary. And we're off to a flying start. And then less than 30 days later, all heck breaks loose. A doggone coronavirus. <laughs> Mayor Q, I still don't know what a coronavirus is. All I know is it wreaked havoc. The Big 12 shut down the basketball tournament. And we took the lead of the Big 12. We closed that Saturday. We closed on March 13th. And we shut it our doors for about three months. We reopened on June 16th of 2020 to a very brand new world, a brand new world of uncertainty and, and trying to lead through that world of uncertainty, having these conversations with the leaders of this organization on how we were going to try and protect our staff. No layoffs, no furloughs. And then walking out and saying, how in the hell are you going to do this? You know, but again, for me, it's about resiliency. It is about resiliency, and that is the core of this story. You have to dig down. For me, y'all, I, I use a very bad baseball analogy to describe coronavirus. And Frank, I know you'll relate to this. Coronavirus was that big, nasty right-hander <laughs> that threw one high and tight and knocked you down. And so you know you got to get back up. You got to dust yourself back off, get back in the batter's box, and then you got to try to see how you're going to hit this sucker. And that's exactly what I think all of us who were involved in trying to lead through one of the most challenging times in world history, not just American history, in world history. But I tell you this, it was about a year later that the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, in partnership with hy V, we brought that vaccine to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And we vaccinated over 2,000 people in the confines of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And at that point in time, I felt like we were fighting back. You know, at first you, were, you got an opponent and you don't even know who this opponent is, but I felt like we were fighting back. And, and, and I'm gonna say this, this was, I think one of the greatest examples of community leadership for our museum. And we've always felt like we were a community leader. Because please understand that to get black folks, number one, to take the vaccine. We couldn't do this in a clinical environment. The history has kind of, it has created this illusion of what was the past and the fear that still is driven by that. And so for us to be able to provide that life-saving vaccine in a culturally enriched environment and the fact that they trust the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is what led to the success that we had. And it's something that I think was one of the most important things that our museum has ever done. And, and that's something that we are inherently proud of. And again, as we continue to do the work that we do, we will always be driven by all of our efforts to make sure that we are enhancing the quality of life for the people who live, work, and play in this community. And so that is at the heart and soul of this museum. That is what Negro Leagues Baseball did for this community. And it is, I think, we have a social and civic responsibility and historical responsibility to do the exact same thing. Uh, I know that we, thank you, thank you. So okay, I know we run out of time. One final question that I wanted to ask you guys, and I think this is great for the entire audience. I just want to know what you see as the traits for being a great leader. Any, any specific traits that you think are necessary to become a great leader? And I'm going to pose that question to all three of you all, uh, and then we're going to let everybody go and enjoy the rest of their President's Day and 
Uh, I'm going down to Jeff City later on. I got to go put my, well, I got my bagging shoes on. So I'm going, <laughs> I got to go meet with legislators and see if I can keep the museum in the state's budget. And, uh, and they have been tremendously supportive of this project as well. I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to Barbara Washington, State Senator Barbara Washington, who has generated over $2 million to help the, the transformation of this building, and I think that deserves a round of applause. So any traits, Q, if you, were, if you had a message for young folks who want to come into public service and have a desire to be an outstanding leader, are there any traits that you think they should be building on? You know, what people don't think about a lot is how much we study and we prepare each day for what we're trying to face. You know, if you just watch TV, you think it's how well you either speak or, or the coalition you've built, but it's really doing your work in advance. So the biggest thing I would say to people who are interested either in this city or whatever it is they're getting into, learn about the institution you're trying to be about. Learn about all of the challenges that exist. Learn about all the people that may be on your side, not on your side, but really that studying is such a key part of what you do. And just one little one, because you said one, adding to that, make sure you're listening. You can learn more from listening to somebody, getting their story <laughs> for three minutes than you ever can from just talking yourself for two hours. Yeah, yeah. Mayor Garner. Well, I... I to build on what Mayor Quentin Lucas said, I, I think when you get into government, when you get into public service, it's not about you. And I think that's something we need to remember. It should never be about you. It should start with a vision. It should always be about the people and how you can improve people's lives. Coming at you with the knowledge, especially being black, that sometimes you've got to work twice as hard and you're going to still be considered average. The scrutiny is going to be great. I've watched these great leaders. I've watched other great leaders such as Emmanuel Cleaver. We can talk about President Barack Obama how that microscope was on them, more so than any other mayor. Scrutiny, criticism, haters, all those things that are thrown out there. So you gotta work hard. Um, I believe in servant leadership and that is something that I'm, I'm really true to. That means getting out in front, being resilient, and letting other people see that you're willing to put in the work and that you're willing to take the lead um, in light of any scrutiny, in any challenges, and really uh, support those that are with you um, and so you're not walking so much ahead, but you're walking with. Um, and all of you are afraid confronting these challenges together. Not so much what you can do, but what you, we all can do together. And I think those are really key when you talk about young people looking at getting into leadership. Always make it about the people. And then we, we talked earlier about uh, um, a vision, that whole vision of not just who we are, but who we, sh who we can be. And, and staying true to those goals. And then never giving up. Don't quit. So if any young people are watching, no matter what you go through, no matter who hates, who scrutinizes, who says what about you, when they come at you, prove them wrong, stay true, and don't give up. Absolutely. And, and, and Frank. Well, Bob, with me, it's, when I talk to high school kids uh, and, and you get to the Q&A part, they all want to know how much money you make, what kind, of, <laughs> what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in. And those are all, those are all important, don't get me wrong. Uh, but what I, what I encourage uh, young people to do is look at, look at things through the long view. Uh, it's easy to look at the short view and want to be where you are right now, but look at the long view and how hard someone had to work to get to where they are. And I think by doing that, they'll, they'll feel that they're going through the life lessons yeah. they have to go through in order to, uh, uh, to get to where they are. I remember when I was picking cotton in Mississippi, and I looked at my dad. I said, why are we doing this? And he says, well, because we have to. And he said, just look at it this way. It, it, it's it's going to build character. And, and <laughs> I didn't see it at the time. But, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's those things that I try to encourage uh, that sometimes some of us have to go through a little bit more to get to where we finally end up. And it's those things that you go through are the things that make you who you are yeah. and make it easy for you to uh, translate it back to young people and try to get them uh, just look at Because I always say hard work plus opportunity equals success. And, and if you get those opportunities, that's great. And I'll, I'll just share one quick story with me. My dad was 12 years old playing over at Prairie Park. 
And after the third game, I hadn't played. And so my dad was one of those guys that if I'm pitching, he's going to get kicked out of the ballpark. And if I'm playing somewhere else, he's fine. Uh, but he, after the third game, I wasn't playing, so he grabbed me by my shirt and took me off the bench. He said, let's get out of here. And I'm 12 years old. I'm crying and kicking, you know, embarrassed as heck. And I, I get home, and I say, well, why did you take me off the team? He says, well, he said, do you like baseball? I said, yeah. He said, do you understand baseball? I said, yeah, I'm going to be 12. He's saying, yeah, to everything. <laughs> and, and he said, well, how, how can you like baseball and understand baseball when you don't play? And I didn't have an answer for him. So he took me and put me on the worst team in the league, and we didn't win, but I played every day. And that's when I understood uh, that I had a passion to play the game. I started understanding baseball at that time. So, so I think these are the, the life lessons that I always like to leave with kids is that sometimes it's easier to put yourself where somebody is versus going back and looking how did they – what were the steps they took to get to where they are. Yeah. And those are the things I like to instill in, in people when I'm uh, talking about uh, leadership. It's sometimes it's the hard work that you put in – to get there. And as Mary Q said, you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to listen. You have to be able to uh, put people in a position that they can succeed. And you also have to be able to deliver good constructive criticism. And they have to believe in you. And you have to be decisive, decisive in your decisions. And I think once they believe in you and they trust you that you are taking them in the right direction, uh, then I think that that is what it all, that's what it's all about. Yeah, no, I, I concur with all three of you, and, and I have been so tremendously blessed that I got to spend time with one of the greatest leaders on the face of this planet, the late, great Buck O'Neill. And you don't know why you're put in a place, and you don't really understand why, because it could have been anyone. It could have been anyone in this same role that I am in, and I got to hang out with Buck O'Neill they paid me to hang out with Buck O'Neill. Uh -huh. And I would have done it for absolutely free. But it goes back to something you said, Q. The smartest thing that I ever did was I kept my mouth closed and I listened. And I listened. The, the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight that he had. And it was there. He didn't force it on you, but it was there for you if you wanted it. And, and I'm, I'm being sin, totally sincere here. I talk to Buck almost every single day. Now, he doesn't always talk back to me. Yeah, no, no, but I talk to Buck almost every single day. And, and I do believe that there were those who would be afraid to walk in his enormous shoes because you would be naive to think that you could feel them. There's no way possible you could feel his shoes. But for me, it's an honor to walk in his footsteps. And his shadow, which could seem so large and overbearing, it protects me. I really believe this, Reverend Hill, that he guides my footsteps. Because I ain't that smart. I'm really not. And, and so the decisions that we have to make, and we do so every single day. We're making decisions. And the thing that me and our team, we talk about, we make our decisions based on what is in the best interest of the organization. It's just a simple principle that, we're, that was driven by Buck O'Neill and those who were involved with helping form this great museum. And so as we remember the legendary Andrew Rube Foster, who once, Frank, commanded 13 consecutive bunts against the team that he was playing against. They were losing the game. Rube had his team drop. 13 bunts in a row. They came back and won that game. The other team didn't adjust too well. They did never they? adjusted. <laughs> they never adjusted. He believed that he could put so much pressure on the opposing team's defense, and that's what happens when the ball is in play. I say that as we get ready to move into a new Major League Baseball season, our minor league monarch season. I hope we see the ball in play a little bit more than what we have and not all these strikeouts. But that's a, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> But, y'all, I want you to please give a, a tremendous gratitude to three of the Metroplex great leaders, Mayor Quentin Lucas, Mayor Tyrone Garner, and Jackson County Executive Frank White. I'm Bob Kendrick, and on behalf of all of us, and I think Kim's going to close this out, 
I also want to thank my friend over at the Black Chamber, the Heartland Black Chamber of Commerce, for their continued support of the Negro League Baseball Museum, led by, of course, Kim Randolph. Kim, you feel free to close us out. Okay. So, did you get enough today? I, I want to tell a quick story about this building, though, because I'm going to age myself real quick. <laughs> My mother went to KU, and at the time that she went to KU, black students were not allowed to live on campus. I don't even think they were allowed to live in Kansas. But anyway, uh, they lived in a lot of KU students, uh, even uh, great athletes lived in this, this building, and they would ride a school bus at 3 o'clock in the morning, and, and this was back in the day when they didn't have highways, to KU, and then the same day have to come back. I ran track for the Kansas City Stars uh, when I was at, at St. Vincent's, which is now Operation Breakthrough. When I walked in this building, uh, back when we had the Buckle Near, I, had Hall of Fame Gala. I cried because I remembered this building. It's not very often that you can come into your own neighborhood. I want to thank my pastor, but she just left. I'm a member of the Centennial United Methodist Church. This is my community, and I am so proud of what's going on in this community. I want to thank you, Mayor Q. I want to thank you, Mayor Garner. That is a big deal in Wyandotte, to have you step up and be a mayor and then to take the scrutiny that you have to. Uh, being the first, in 2023, we're still calling first. One of these days, we're going to be a full America. Yeah, and I'm going to say it again. We're going to be a full America where it's not the first. And then we have Frank White, who is also a friend. I am fortunate to call all three of these men friends. Who would have thunk it that I would be here today? Bob Kendrick, Kiana, I want to thank you both for being partners with the Heartland Black Chamber of Commerce. If you're not a member of the chamber, yes, I'm going to throw a shameless plug. You need to give us a call because we need your support. This is what leadership looks like, but they cannot lead unless they work together, unless we support them, and unless they support one another. That's what it's about. We want to thank you guys for taking out your President's Day. The bobbleheads on the table, don't fight over them. <laughs> first come, first serve. You can take the bobblehead. And we want you to have an awesome, awesome, awesome day. Remember, 18th and Vine, historic. It's our home, and it's your home, and you're invited down here. Let's keep moving. Thank you, Bob, again. Oh, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate your support. Mm -hmm.